And then we get to rapid closed loop where you need to know what's going on before you give the next bit of, of hormone. Glucose is so right now, you know, standard monitoring, you need at least four blood tests a day. And people with diabetes are pretty well trained. They're educated in, you know, the, uh, the different uh, doses they need to give depending on the blood sugar signal they see, what they've eaten. Many times they'll have at their disposal different uh, kinetics of, of insulin, slow release and fast. But this is, the hard part here is compliance. Uh, understandable. This is, you know, more than a thousand finger sticks in a year. Uh, different populations of patients keep up with that to different levels. Kids and teenagers tend to be resistant. Veterans tend to be resistant. Uh, uh, but in general, you know, this is not a, a small issue. Even if you don't have uh, one of these immediate life-threatening things, very chronic issues operating over years, if your blood sugars tend to run a little high for 10, 20 years, if you're kind of doing a good job but not great, well, that's still bad on the long-term time scale. Then you're, then you're getting this blood vessel damage, you're getting predisposition to all, all these constellations of end organ damage due to poor blood supply, uh, predisposing to heart attacks, a stroke, uh, chronic damage to the peripheral nerves, uh, pressure ulcers that can lead to infection, this is why people lose limbs with diabetes. Uh, yeah. The, uh, that's a great question. The question is, could you rely on urine glucose? Um, one challenge with that is it, it doesn't really tell you what the blood glucose is. It's, it's kind of a downstream post-homeostatic regulation effect. So the urine glucose could be high, but that could mean it's already done its job and it's corrected the blood glucose, which is now present. And also you really need, and also it's, it's, it, it's very highly variable uh, you know, by several fold, and it doesn't give you the precision you need. Yeah, this is uh, actually, uh, this just came out in the last couple of months. There's, uh, you might have seen some news stories about it. In fact, we, we should probably post those. That's, it's still, uh, I would say, jury's still out on how safe or effective it is, but, but that's exactly right. There are ways of using uh, interstitial fluid and accessing it. Contact lens is one way, and actually, uh, we'll show you another interstitial fluid detector as well. So that's, a, that's a big opportunity um, that's just coming out, but still uh, unclear, really, how. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you need active finger stick requires you to be awake. Uh, you don't get it during. Uh... So what have people done? Well, uh, you basically you want to have a replacement pancreas. The pancreas is is what's doing the job. It, the beta cells are detecting sugar and then releasing insulin. You want to mimic really the beta cell. Um, well, uh, so if you could imagine what it would be, uh, it, it, would, it would be doing that role. Uh, you could imagine a pump, and indeed this, many people have these now, uh, pumps that uh, uh, have a direct delivery, direct access uh, through the skin uh, with, uh, for delivery of insulin. And there are different ways that it can have uh, glucose sensing that can be separate from the pump, uh, uh, and it extends the uh, glucose signal. Directly. Um, of course, here, you know, this is raising the other problem. You detect glucose, but then you've got to deliver insulin, and, and both of those involve uh, access. Um, now, a lot of people have the pumps. Uh, particularly young people are very resistant to this uh, as well. They really don't want to have pumps that uh, still challenge um, in, in medicine, even though the right device kind of exists, you have very poor acceptance by a, a very large. Uh... So what else could you do? Well, you know, we'd like to have things under the skin. You know, they, they just don't like being attached to this machine. It definitely could uh, put something under the skin. If you could maybe even a, a cellular artificial pancreas, that would be good. 
or if you could somehow shrink everything down and, and put, make the whole thing less uh, obvious, that would also help. Um, so, you know, miniaturization is, is actually pretty useful. So, uh, there are now sensors that, uh, including the contact lens strategy, but also little patches that you can put on the skin that don't directly measure the blood vessel glucose, but they measure the interstitial fluid glucose, which is the fluid sloshing around in between cells. It's not in cells, it's not in vessels, it's the third space, the interstitial fluid. And that tracks blood glucose pretty well, much closer than urine. And uh, by imposing little electric fields, you can help drive that uh, interstitial fluid uh, toward and, and away from your sensor. And you can uh, make measurements which are pretty accurate uh, without penetrating the skin. Um, and this is now, uh, you know, there are some drawbacks to how long the sensors last is an issue. Um, where the data goes, how it gets uh, processed is an issue. Now, you can actually, though, have this even on a, a wristwatch. There's a, a so Gluco watch is, uh, is available now. You can measure interstitial glucose. Still, of course, there's still the insulin delivery issue, but, uh, well, you've got to still calibrate it with a finger stick, uh, but you get every 10 minutes, you get a measurement. Um, again, there's some skin irritation. The sensor has a finite lifetime, has a two-hour warm-up period, but uh, it's still pretty good. So this whole uh, interstitial system um, uh, basically uh, uh, drives uh, movement of this interstitial fluid using uh, very low-intensity uh, electric fields. And uh, that is... Uh, Something that um, uh, solves the detection problem ultimately, but this biocompatibility uh, is, is probably a limiting issue. We see this in all kinds of tissue hardware interfaces. You know, mentioned with uh, deep brain stimulation, the uh, electrodes in the brain they'll work for a while, they'll stop working after uh, a couple of years. Um, and what happens? Well, there's a tissue reaction. The tissue reacts, builds up, encases the uh, invasive element in the glia, and it stops working after a while. Similar principle everywhere, uh, and it's a common theme. We're always looking for ways to improve the uh, compatibility of our hardware with uh, third space. Um, it's kind of interesting, though, to think, uh, reflect on how far we've come. So the initial pump. Um, so little, little progress has been made. Um, and so then the question is, how could you truly make it closed loop and combine the monitoring with uh, delivery and put all that in some uh, unobtrusive situation. And uh, how do you make sure there's reliable communication between the sensor and the pump? Is it, you know, do you use radio frequency, which would go everywhere? The question is, would there be interference with other radio frequency? Okay, this, again, life and death thing. It's not like a little bit of, uh, you know, noise is tolerable in the system. You really have to make sure that it, getting the information exactly what you need and when. Or do you design it with an infrared system, kind of infrared beam, line of sight? That's good. It's less susceptible to interference. But then what if there's a disruption in that, uh, that line of sight communication? So uh, different strategies, a very active area for device-minded bioengineering. For cellular-minded folks, you know, there's the question as well, let's, let's make New beta cells, can we do that? That's really what we want. We want the cell knows how to do it. Let's, let's provide the cell in some way. Um, so you could imagine stem cell-based uh, production of beta cells. In theory, it looks pretty simple. And with all the advances that have come in stem cells, you could even make the patient's own beta cells, in theory, from iPS cells. And we'll talk more about this in our, our stem cell lectures. But then there are, even if that were completely reliable, which it's not, uh, then there'd be the question of what, what do you do with those cells? Do, what do you inject them into the pancreas? What's the nature of their blood supply? That's, gonna, that's how they're going to detect sugar, but also how they're going to deliver the insulin. If that's not exactly right, serious trouble. If they overgrow, undergrow, you're going to get impaired regulation. And again, you've got to be exactly right. There's no wiggle room here. Um, so maybe you could encapsulate them in some kind of membrane. At least you wouldn't have a cancer risk there. It's not like they would proliferate and, and cause uh, tumors. Uh, but then you you know you exactly designing that becomes interesting. Um, protecting them from the immune system, but 
They still need access for, for nutrients and oxygen, and so they should have a, a, a permeable membrane of some sort. Uh, is it going to be biodegradable? Probably not, but it's got to be biocompatible to not cause a, a tissue reaction. And so there are a lot of interesting uh, sort of eyelet sheet technologies that are being a lot of engineering problems, not nearly uh, as simple as you'd like. And finally, there are, you know, you could imagine even non-beta cell related engineered therapies for, for diabetes. And here you might think about one resistant form as an opportunity. It's much more common, not obviously treated by insulin because the body's got plenty of insulin. The problem is the tissue response. And there, you know, the, the goal is to reduce weight, you know, uh, reduce obesity, lifestyle modifications help, and, but interventions to re reduce uh, body weight are clearly a strategy to go. And so the, here's an interesting strategy, the endo barrier, uh, still in, in development, but effectively, it's an endoscopically placed sleeve for your intestine, it gets anchored in there, and that prevents absorption basically coats intestine uh, in something that acts as a physical barrier that digestive fluid travels through and uh, not get uh, absorbed. So that's interesting. It's been tested and actually approved in some cases. Um, trials ongoing in the U.S., but actually does cause uh, weight loss and, and uh, elevates uh, hormones that are involved in helping to regulate uh, better. Um, Diabetic patients, type 2, who, who uh, use this, they have glucose. And then this, hemoglobin A1C, this is a glycosylated hemoglobin. This is sort of a measure of the integral of elevated glucose over time. I mentioned this glycosylation that happens that causes disruption in uh, tissue. This is a lab test. It's a measurable that you can check every couple months and measures sort of the integrated level of protein glycosylation that's happened over that interval. Patients with the endobarrier have reduced uh, hemoglobin. So some uh, promise there as well, a neat sort of concept. Okay, so that's endocrine. We talked about what it is, where it is, interactions, uh, all the engineering applications and possibilities ranging from modeling uh, to detection, devices, medication, chemical engineering. Any questions? Endocrine, the whole thing. Yeah. How does the tissue lose its sensitivity to insulin? That is a kind of a million dollar question. If we knew that, we could probably design better therapies for uh, insulin resistant diabetes. Um, to my knowledge, it's simply not known. Um, if anybody else knows, uh, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental mystery. Why it relates to weight and exercise, not clear. Yeah, great question. For people who work non-typical schedules, uh, how does that affect their hormone uh, regulation and are there chronic or, or acute problems? So indeed, there is an acute disruption and that contributes to a lot of the problems people have with adjusting to, to circadian clock changes. Uh, in theory, uh, the body adjusts and indeed the circadian rhythm adjusts and the hormone regulation adjusts and uh, people can maintain a chronically uh, shifted, as long as it's a stably shifted circadian rhythm for a long period of time. Of course, the problem is people have weekends and so on, and, and they don't stay on that shifted uh, level no matter what. And so it, it actually, the long-term health consequences of, of uh, shift work are probably significant no matter what.